that the key to being successful uh, in your career is to be so good they can't ignore you. And so this book is maybe the other half of that about how do you get good at things. One of the things of that, that you talk a lot about and, and even in, inside of like what we teach in our mentoring program mm -hmm. is first view how successful people have done. Like the best way to reach any goal is to learn from someone who's done it. One thing you can discover is that the people who seem to get ahead are not just doing what they're told. They're doing more than what they're told. They're doing the things that are going to make them better than the average person. And I think, again, in an uncertain future, you want to invest in flexibility. Improvement, another point is worth mentioning is improvement at domains also can be kind of exponentially harder. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome back to this episode of the How to Get a Job podcast. Today, we have an amazing guest. We will be talking about, about how to get better at anything, and I have bestseller author Scott H. Young. Scott, welcome to the show. Yeah, great to be here. So I'm excited to have this conversation because learning is a skill set that you will forever need, right? And, and a lot mm -hmm. of times I think we think that just because we're done with school where we're done learning, but to be successful in our career, we're going to always need to be learning. And so uh, I appreciate uh, you sharing this book and even reading it was really great. But why don't you tell us why did you decide to write this book and how does this apply yeah. to people's career as well? Yeah, I mean, I have been interested in this topic. Like it's basically defined my entire career. I've been writing online for almost two decades and learning has been kind of the recurrent theme of that. So from sort of my early days when I was giving study skills advice to college students to some later days where I was doing projects, learning languages, self-teaching myself a degree, quantum mechanics, portrait drawing, uh, all sorts of skills. And that culminated in a 2019 book, Ultra Learning, which was about people who take on ambitious uh, intensive projects to teach themselves new and difficult skills. And this book was a follow on, which I wanted to focus on some of the fundamental principles that underlie learning, particularly in some of the domains that go outside of the classroom. So I focus mm -hmm. on a lot of stories from, you know, the education of uh, Tetris players to Renaissance painters to fighter jet pilots to science fiction writers. So there's a whole bunch of examples and scientific research that the book has drawn on about how you can get better at things. And of course, getting better at things is essential to succeeding in the world of work. I mean, we live in an economy where people pay for human capital. We pay for people who are good at stuff. And that involves a lot of things. But certainly, if you can build career capital, if you can build yourself into the kind of person who can get important stuff done, uh, that is going to positively affect your career success rate. So, I mean, I'm a really big fan of uh, Cal Newport's book, So Good They Can't Ignore You, which really makes this argument very clear that the key to being successful uh, in your career is to be so good they can't ignore you. And so this book is maybe the other half of that about how do you get good at things. I love it. And when I was reading your book, you broke it down into three stages, right? View mm -hmm. others do it, practice doing it, and, and Im imitate or immediate feedback. Can you elaborate? Yeah. Can we go down into those three things? Because I think yeah. that's obviously like for me, the biggest takeaway of the book is like you give a bunch of examples, but if I can yeah. be conscious of doing this, that's mm -hmm. how obviously the biggest takeaway for me to yeah so the the three big things is first see the idea that most of what we know comes from other people and so if we can facilitate learning from other people we will accelerate our own development this is a particularly important in your career because so much of the knowledge we need to be successful in the workplace is very specific it's something that applies to that job to that kind of task to that role and so what that means is that if you are sort of on the outside or you're having difficulty learning it, it can often be difficult to slot in. So I know a lot of people when they're in school, they learn a lot of academic knowledge, but they're not always super useful right when they land in the job. And so one of the things that you can do to an employer is if you can tell them like, look, I'm able to acquire this really quickly. Like, you know, if we're talking about a programmer and you're, you're doing useful work on an open source mm. library and you have this portfolio, you can say, you know, you can slot me in and I can get to work right away. I mean, that's a big boon for that entry level hire. The second thing is do practice is obviously very important for mastery. I think everyone understands this, but I think it's good to have a mental model of what practice is doing. In particular, it's making skills and the components of skills more automatic, more fluent, more effortless. That's 
very advantageous for something like reading a book, for instance, if you have to figure out what each letter, which sound it makes and try to string it together, you're never going to be able to understand the meaning of the text. But it also has this disadvantage that if you spend a lot of time practicing the wrong skill, then you can also get yourself stuck because you can spend a lot of time getting good at one method, but it turns out you need to be good at another one. So that also brings us back to that first point of figuring out what the right methods is, what are the right skills to master. And then finally, feedback. Feedback has a lot of important influences on learning, but particularly when we're talking about this sort of career context, being able to be in the world of work, seeing what skills are actually practiced, seeing what's actually necessary, very important because otherwise it's very easy for you to get good at something that's a little disconnected from what you actually need to be getting good at. Yeah, I, I love this because like what what one of the things of that, that you talk a lot about and, and even in, inside of like what we teach in our mentoring program mm -hmm. is first view how successful people have done. Like the best way to reach any goal is to learn from someone who's done it. And it's not so much about like reinventing the wheel from day one. It's like, hey, just implement what's already been working and then from there add to it, right? And then uh, I also think you talked a lot of, like that resonated with me is how that practicing doing it is really important. It's not just reading the book and doing it, but actually mm -hmm. practicing it and then yeah. getting the feedback, right? And, and so that you're working on the right things. And it's like, like practice doesn't make perfect is perfect practice and makes perfect. And, <laughs> and I... And those things were are, are so important. And I think for it's especially when you think about looking for a job, I think it's important to understand, okay, like what is the best way? And I tell our clients, like the best way for you to get a job at Google is to speak to people who got a job at Google, right? Mm -hmm. And understand how they did it and see the common factors that they have. Is there a particular profile? Is there a is there a set of universities, there's particular skill sets, and not just the company, but also the role itself within Google. And then also, too, and when you say practice, and I kind of reference it back to like the job cycle, do you have internships and why internships are so valuable? Mm -hmm. Why do companies value internships more than most classwork? It's because of the ability that you are, you have a proven track record of practicing what you learn. Um, and so that's, that's really interesting. What advice would you have for someone that's, you know, graduating college and they're so used to being taught what to learn, but they're about to mm -hmm. go to the corporate world where there isn't that much more guidance on how to continue to learn. Yeah, I mean, it's a real problem. I think all of us, whether we want to or not, end up becoming self-directed learners. You yeah. know, when we're in kindergarten, grade one, I mean, you're not thinking at all about what you're learning. You're just doing what you're told. And then when you get to high school, maybe college, there's a little bit more autonomy. You know, you have to study a little bit on your own. You have to do the homework to decide when you have time for that. But you're still being told what to learn. And I think it often gets to a point where we are out in the world and we sort of assume this pattern is going to continue, that we're just going to keep being told what we need to learn. And then we discover, maybe, maybe some people don't discover it, but one thing you can discover is that the people who seem to get ahead are not just doing what they're told. They're doing more than what they're told. They're doing the things that are going to make them better than the average person. And so I think that ability to choose projects, to choose what to work on, to have goals and to learn to fulfill them, it's a very important part of, I think, being successful in your career, whether or not you're, you know, entrepreneur, freelancer, or even just, you know, working within a company. Um, you know, I, I don't remember who said this, but I think it's a very useful quote to thinking about it is uh, the system is not your friend, but basically like all the forces that exist in the working world that are pushing you to do things are not necessarily doing them to maximize your benefit, like to improve your career. Yeah. Like when you get into a job, if you're an internship, yeah, maybe they want you to just go around and get people coffee because that's all you're really good at right now. And yeah. that's going to be, you know, make their lives a little easier, but you're not learning the real skills. And so you have to take that initiative to learn the important things, to put yourself front and center with people who have the knowledge so you can observe from them to, you know, push yourself to get on those projects that are going to be learning experiences, even though you're not like totally qualified to do them yet. You need to push yourself to get that feedback when, you know, maybe your peers or boss would just like, eh, you know, you're not doing that great work, but I'm not going to give you that much information for how to fix it. I think that initiative is really important. And so you have to eventually develop that mindset of, um, of taking on that self-directed approach. And how would you suggest overcoming the failure that comes when you're trying to do something great? Because like if you, yeah. to those examples that you share, right? Like, like if you're told, hey, what we expect from you is for you to just go get coffee. And that's mm -hmm. what we consider success in this role as interns. But you, you, 
you know that the ones who will go above and beyond and take some of that risk, there's some good reward but sometimes that means failure so how to yeah. mitigate that risk of failure and how do you handle that failure when you're going through learning something great well i think something that's really underrated when we're talking about making advances in your career is just uh thinking of stuff that would be useful and just doing it and not asking for permission um a lot of people like i've had this happen to me i don't know whether you have running this podcast but if occasionally you get people who like they want to maybe learn from you so they're like how could i help is there anything that i could like work on or do this kind of thing and i hate to be rude to those people but i'm kind of like ah, i don't know like i you know like it's kind of you're asking you're making a job for me to like think yeah. of something that i could maybe give you and i know that sounds really like arrogant of me but I don't know what you're good at. I don't know what you could do. I have no idea what might be useful for, for you to do, especially if I'm not already working with you. Whereas someone who just says, you know what? I see that you've done this, but it would be better if you did it this way. And look, I'm going to mock it up for you. Like the people who take those kinds of initiatives, yeah, maybe not that particular thing is not going to be something that gets used. But I think it does two things. First of all, it puts you into this rarefied category of people who take initiative. Most people do not take initiative. So even if the thing you're yeah. suggesting isn't helpful, you're already in the top 10% because you know what? People don't do that. And then the second thing is that it is a foot in the door. It is a way to get in contact with people, to get uh, further with people. Like this is why. I think, uh, you know, in, in the tech world, at least a lot of open source projects contributing them are so important because again, most people, they're not contributing to projects in their spare time. They're not doing these kind of learning opportunities. So already you're moving yourself to that 10%, but then it's also a way for you to gain skills, to learn how things work, to do things that are useful. Um, and so that would be my advice is it's not as complicated as you think. It's more about having this sort of idea that again, just shifting out of that mindset of, well, I do things because I'm told to do them. I do things because I've been given permission to do them. I mean, if, if you want to just like step up and be helpful, step up and do something that, you know, you think needs doing, I think that can be very powerful. How do you see, you know, AI or even ChatGPT change yeah. the way people learn? I mean, it's crazy right now. I think uh, the history of AI predictions are fraught. Like if you go back to the 1950s when, you know, the original pioneers, you know, you know, your Marvin Minsky or Herbert Simons, these people are making predictions. Like they're almost laughably comical about what they thought would be easy and what they thought would be hard. I mean, I think one of the most famous ones is like one of the initial pioneers was saying, well, we're going to um, have a 10 man team working over the summer and we're going to make significant progress in like understanding language and understanding reasoning and all these things. And just like now that was like, well, that was ridiculous. It turns out they're extremely hard problems. And then on the other hand, you know, you go back even five, six years ago and people are not predicting what ended up happening, you know, with ChatGPT and these uh, large language models and transformers. So it's very difficult to see how things are going to go in the future. But I do think that that uncertainty means we need to be more nimble. It means we need to be more open to change in our career, more open to adapting our skill set. I mean, I think if anything, the fact that these tools seem to be pretty good at programming, they seem to be pretty good at a lot of like language stuff means that interpersonal skills, social skills are probably going to be coming at a bit of a premium, you know, uh, because if now, while well, you don't need a code monkey to do some of these jobs, you need someone who can communicate with the client and figure out what they really need and then tell ChatGPT how to make it, that's going to be helpful. But I mean, in the really long run, who knows? I think it's hard to say exactly what's going to get replaced first in our economy, but learning how to learn, learning how to improve ourselves and uh, take on those kinds of projects and initiatives, I think that's an asset in pretty much any plausible future. Yeah, I, I find it really interesting because I think like, just being one, really good at one skill set might not be enough if that skill set ends up being replaced. And if you don't yeah. have the skill set of learning and getting better at something and being uh, flexible to that, I think that's where the struggle would be because like, it, it's so challenging to, to your point, to predict what, what can happen. Like you would assume that the, 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 the jobs that robots or AI was going to take yeah. over were the low labor jobs, but they're actually being <laughs> lawyers and doctors and accountants are probably easier to replace than a plumber that comes to your house. And um, I mean, easy. maybe like this, this stuff yeah. is like, it, I think there's just a lot of uncertainty around it. Like I recently read an article that was talking about how since 2010, the actual amount of employment for 
professional translators has actually gone up. Like the amount of industry for professional translators has actually increased, which is crazy when you think the fact that like, first of all, even from 2010, machine translation was pretty good. Like Google Translate was pretty good in 2010 and it's only gotten better. And it's clearly one of the jobs where like, well, the machine is actually probably better than almost all translators. So it's sort of like, why is this continuing to operate? Well, I think probably some of it is liability. Some of it is that like the cost of mistakes are high, you know, technical documents, you know, if you're doing a legal draft, maybe you can't trust chat to be, I don't know what all the reasons are, but I just think, um, I think again, in an uncertain future, you want to invest in flexibility. I want to change the conversation a little bit, but um, I am fascinating and I'm fascinated by like learning and, and mm -hmm. wanting to do set goals and more than anything, more than learning goal setting, right. And trying yeah. to accomplish really big things. So uh, I would sign up for things like an eight week stand up comedy kit. So in the end I have mm -hmm. to do five, five hours live and I've never done it before and it's scary yeah. or sign up for an Ironman or sign up for like mm -hmm. a 75 heart. Right. For me, I have a challenge of, the challenge of is I'm trying to accomplish too many things. I'm trying to learn too many things at once. Yeah. Uh, how do you suggest prioritizing or help organize that? Yeah. Because like when I try to do too many things and none of them happen, some of the things that I thought I wanted to do and never did was get better at chess, right? Or, mm -hmm. um, or learn a second, a third <laughs> language. Yeah. Well, so I think there's a, there's a few points to make about it. So one is sort of in the broad view of your life, what do you want to accomplish? And I think, uh, I think like for me, for instance, I, I like learning lots of different things. And so I'd rather be a little bit more diversified. I've learned a few too many hobbies, a few too many subjects, a few yeah. too many skills, even if that precludes me being a specialist in any of them, just in my entire lifespan, I like that breadth. It's more interesting for me. I think it's more useful as my job as being a kind of like um, popular idea person. I think I'm, I'm more suited for being a generalist. If I was a specialist on one topic, I'd write one book and then the career's over, right? Yeah. Um, so there is that kind of broader dilemma of how specialized, how broad you want to be. But at a more fundamental level, there's also the question of scheduling and actually getting it done. Mm -hmm. So so what you were talking about, I think, now I'm not sure whether this is your particular problem, but like it is a common problem, is that it's trying to do too many things at the same time, I think, that can create some friction. Because any learning goal is sort of, uh, by its very definition, something that's not a habit, something that you're like, you're yeah. doing something new, you're getting your brain to do something that is unfamiliar for it. So it is effortful, it requires attention. It often requires a little bit of planning because, you know, other than there's like a few cases where you can just do the same thing over and over and over again and keep accumulating knowledge. But usually that's not the case. Usually you have to keep mixing it up, doing different things. You know, you started doing some programming project and now you've kind of learned that sort of slice of programming and now you have to do a different kind of project to keep improving and so on. And so because of this need for attention, this need for planning, this need for goal-directed activity, I think that these sort of bursts often work better when you only have one project at a time. Now, there are situations you can get out of that. Like, I think if you're in a structured kind of curriculum, like you're in school and you have these five classes and someone else is mm -hmm. like telling you when the assignments are coming and when you have to study for things, it is possible to do more than one. But for self-directed projects that no one's forcing you to do, I think the default is to do nothing. And so if you're going to do anything, it is better to do just one thing. And so like you were saying, I think like doing an eight week stand up comedy project is like a really good idea because it's a focused period of time. You give it your full attention. And yeah, maybe you're not going to be Jerry Seinfeld at the yeah, end of it, yeah. but you're going to have gotten to some point. And then if you decide you want to switch to something else after, I think that's okay. So I think these four, these focus bursts on particular projects are particularly valuable. Now there's a question of how many of these projects you want to do. Like, do you want to actually learn comedy and French and Spanish and, you know, calculus and all these different kinds of things, because obviously if you just focused on stand-up comedy, you'd be more likely to be really, really good at it. But there's, uh, but that that's the trade-off, right. Of, of how many things you want to do and, and what you're doing them for. But I would say that that sequential approach is probably good for learning projects. A follow-up on this, because something you said uh, that really caught my attention, like I am, a, I feel like I'm a generalist too. And like mm -hmm. you mentioned, like you, you rather mm -hmm. learn a, a different things. But how is learning or, you know, learning anything, right, different when you're learning, 
let's you know the 80 20 rule like in 20 yeah. percent of the time i can learn 80 percent. so it'd be really easy for yeah. me to get really good at jiu-jitsu in the beginning but to go from a brown belt to a black belt might be yeah. very, much harder than going from a white belt to a yellow belt right uh in, in that scenario the way that you learn the mastery when you're in the top 10 percent when you're trying to get to the top 10 percent of something versus when you're just trying to get to the top 75 percent should you shift the way you you do things or is it still yeah. the same three-step process I mean, you still need those components. And as I talk about in the book, it's not as if like, like the seeing is sort of often leans towards beginners, because if you don't know at all how to do a skill, then following instructions is really helpful. But it's also the case that the people at the top of their game spend a lot of time studying other people too. So, you know, the best chess players are studying the other chess games of great masters. They're not just playing their own games. But I do think that um, the, the way you practice and what the obstacles for performance and improvement are change depending on your skill level. Um, definitely in the beginning, there's a lot of things that you can get approximately right and it will be good enough. And, and so if that's your goal is to get good enough, often it's about just like overcoming inertia, making sure you're spending enough time practicing it all, having like in the right ballpark of the correct technique. But if you've been doing something for a very long time, I think the emphasis shifts. So one of the things is that like, if you've been doing something in your job for let's say a decade, chances are any kind of skill you're practicing all the time is very automated, very proceduralized. So that idea of practice, making things more automatic, more fluent, um, that process has gone on for a very long time. So those skills are very automatic. And so sometimes you get in a situation where that fluency, that automaticity actually works against you because it's harder to um, do something different than you've been doing for a very long period of time. And it takes this deliberate effort. So there was this um, psychologist, uh, Carl Anders Ericsson, and he proposed this theory of deliberate practice, which was arguing that people at the elite, people who are you know musicians, chess players, the elite, the way they continue to get better despite this sort of automaticity curve is by doing this deliberate practice where they are bringing back conscious attention to a very small focal part of their performance. And they're using a coach and feedback and sort of constrained like kind of practice types are deliberately forcing their brain to go down a different path than it would automatically. And that is the way that they continue to get better mm. when most of us would have plateaued for a long time. So I do think, you know, that kind of deliberate practice, it tends to be more of a factor when, you know, you've been doing it for a really long time. So you're kind of at the, you know, the, the, the sort of asymptote of how good you're going to get at it. Whereas if you're just learning a skill for the first time, it's maybe less relevant because you actually learn a lot from just sort of, you know, watching people trying to copy what they do, get in the right ballpark, you know? Yeah. I've been playing soccer for over 20 years and I mm -hmm. haven't gotten better in the last five. It's probably <laughs> yeah. There's no more deliberate practice. I'm just going to, and to a pre like just to play for fun and I'm not trying yeah. to focus on improving my passing or improving my shooting or improving my vision. Which makes well, sense. an improvement, another point it's worth mentioning is improvement at domains also can be kind of exponentially harder. Like the classic yeah. example is learning a language, like the top 100 most frequent words are something like, I don't know, I think it's the top thousand most frequent words in English is something like 85% of the words we speak. Yeah. So to, to learn those words and learn them adequately, like you're getting 85% of the speech to learn like the you know, to get from 99 to 99.9%, .9%, you're learning, you know, tens of thousands of words that show up almost never. So the amount of exposure you need to properly yeah. learn those words is just gargantuan. And so this, this relationship is true of languages, but it's true of all skills. And so, you know, in some cases, like that's why, you know, you can become pretty good at chess in a short period of time, but it would take you decades of like real intensive study to become a grandmaster because, you're just learning these increasingly rare patterns and mastering these, you know, weirder situations as you go on. Yeah. Uh, do you think, you know, like sometimes I, I'll end up doing a task and it could be a new task for me, but it mm -hmm. feels like time flew. And other times yeah. like hot yoga that my wife is having me do, <laughs> I count every second and every, every like one hour of hot yoga feels like I was there all morning. Right. <laughs> yeah. How much should you should be, we'd be listening to be like, Hey, like this is probably not a, a skill shit you should double down on uh like what's the relationship between flow and learning is yeah yeah flow and learning because yeah. like for example like i know yoga is good for me i have bad knees i've got acl <laughs> surgeries but i miserably hate it i don't know how i can get good at it well so i mean there's two parts to that so one of them just seems to be like how much should you learn things that you're interested in that you like so if you don't like yoga should you do yoga i think most of the time we're probably wanting to avoid learning things that we don't like because most things you don't need to learn. Like 
you know, maybe you need to improve flexibility or, uh, you know, your neuromuscular system for like stability, but maybe you don't have to do that through yoga. Maybe it's through a dance class or maybe some stretching or something. Right. So yeah. I don't think, I don't think it's the case of like, well, if you don't like hot yoga, then don't do hot yoga. But I think the other question you brought up is like, what's the relationship between flow and learning? And I think it's actually a little bit more complicated because go back to this mental model we had of practice that is making skills more automatic, more effortless. Well, it turns out there's a bit of a sweet spot for how much effort is required because if a skill requires too much effort, so it's kind of in a state of cognitive overload, then it's not flow. It's frustrating. It's halting. So think about when you were first learning to drive a car, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, oh, you know, you're figuring out where the brake is and the gas pedal. And they, you know, maybe you're changing gears if you're driving a manual, like all of these things contribute to this somewhat frustrating experience. And so the early parts of learning many things are not in a flow state because you haven't reached that level of automaticity that would, that would make it smooth. On the other hand, um, if a skill in some cases gets too automated, then th you actually don't need enough cognitive load. There's not enough there. And yeah. so your brain is like, oh, I've got extra capacity. So I'm going to daydream. I'm going to think of something else. So if you think about driving a car now, probably you can listen to an audio book or the radio, or you get a little bored while you're driving because it's too easy. The driving is too yeah. easy. And your brain is kind of like, I'm thinking of something else I can think about. And so flow tends to exist where those task demands are in the middle, where it's not so hard that you're regularly getting into sort of frustrations or impasses, but not so easy or so automated that there's spare room that you can have mental wandering. And I think that is important for our subjective enjoyment of things. But when you think about learning, basically, this is like a fairly narrow range that actually occurs in skill development, yeah. like when the task is perfectly tuned to what is the level of cognitive overload. And it's not even clear that learning is maximized at this point that, you know, um, Anders Ericsson made this uh, famous paper arguing against Cheek sent me high, the, uh, the guy who came up with flow saying that his argument was that no, 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 learning is optimized at the, at the sort of more cognitive overload than the flow state. And I mean, this, this argument is, I don't want to say it's a settled debate, but I think that, um, flow is very good subjectively, but I don't think like the idea that we learn most in the flow state is necessarily correct. When do you know that you're maybe like, like you keep failing and when, when should you know, like to quit? Like, you know, they say, <laughs> no, yeah. everyone learns to walk. Like you don't see a baby stop. Yeah. Like they fall, they get up, they fall, they get up. But when we're adults, we might just fall two times and give up. Like, is there <laughs> a sign for that? Like, like, yeah. We keep going at one point. Well, we quit? Like, I mean, rationally, yeah. Rationally speaking, quitting is not a bad thing. Like it tends to get yeah. a bad rap, but realistically, there's only so much time in the day. There's only so many goals you can pursue in life. This sort of, oh, this is too difficult or I'm not good at this. I'm going to quit is often a reasonable thing to do. You know, it's, uh, like I, I only have so much time for hobbies. I might as well do the ones that are sort of most immediately rewarding and interesting and people think I'm good at than the ones that like, oh, I'm really bad at this. I didn't have to do it. And it's kind of frustrating for me. So I think there are situations where that like that urge to quit when you encounter initial failures can be uh, instinctive and it can also be the right move. Where you get into problems, however, I think is when you do need to accomplish something and you're running into that. So I have this whole chapter in the book where I say that success is the best teacher because those early experiences with the subject, if they are full of failure and frustration, essentially, unless you have a very strong motivation to overcome them because you have an extremely strong extrinsic reason to keep going or because you have like this well of self-confidence that you're willing to like overcome this difficulty essentially most people do what you're saying they like they tried a few times it didn't work and then they quit and so i think if you know you need to pursue a path so you know you need to get a job and you don't like <laughs> going to interviews or you know you need to like learn this skill for work you know you need to be better at public speaking because that's important and you're not good yeah. at it then it's very important to build out small successes you can build out successes by copying other people, looking and seeing what they're doing. You can practice in easier environments. You can spend more time learning the building blocks. There's lots of ways you can increase those early successes, but that's very important if you have to do it. Now, if you don't have to do it, then maybe quitting is rational. You're right. Yeah. Scott, last question. Can you tell us a little bit more about your book and where can, yeah. you know, listeners uh, find a copy? 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I encourage everyone to check out my website, scotthyoung.com. So I've got thousands of articles on motivation, psychology, uh, learning there. And uh, there's also links to Get Better at Anything. It's available Amazon, Audible, wherever you get your books. And they can also check out my previous book, Ultra Learning, which is uh, also, I think, very useful if you're looking to accelerate your career, as the subtitle says. Amazing. Scott, thank you so much for your time. And everyone listening, thank you for listening and catch you guys on the next episode. Thank you.